Good morning, and welcome to the Saturday morning breakfast Bible study of the Patton Memorial Christian Methodist Episcopal Church located at 3547 East 142nd Street in Cleveland, Ohio. I am Pastor Lydia Evelyn Spragan, and I am so glad to have you with us this morning. Good morning, Sister Simmons. Can you hear me? Good morning, Sister Nina. How are you this morning? I am hopeful that you can hear me. Great. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for this time that we have come to study again in your word. We ask, Lord, that you would send your Holy Spirit to lead us and direct us, to guide us, and to teach us all that he would have us to know about your word today and then empower us lord to apply it to our lives in jesus precious name we do pray amen we have been studying the book of psalms and i would like for us to continue to do so today um i would like for you if you have pen and paper this would make it a lot easier for you to take notes it to write down on one side of your paper actually going to write three columns so you might want to put um, fold your paper in three parts uh, lengthways so that you'll have one column then a second column and then a third column now in the first column you're going to write psalms p-s-a-l-m-s -S, psalms and in the second column, you're going to write Christ, Christ. And in the third column, you're going to write New Testament. So in the first column, you're going to have Psalms. In the second column, you're going to have Christ, C-H-R-I-S-T, apostrophe S. And then in the third column, you're going to write New Testament. Now, I'm going to give you the middle column first so that you will have a clue as to how we're going to approach this. Christ Ascension, A-S-C-E-N-S-I-O-N. And then skip a space probably about the width of two fingers or three fingers and go down to the next word which is betrayal maybe two fingers will do betrayal b-e-t-r-a-y-a-l then the next word you're going to write in the center column is death death D-E-A-T-H. The next word you're going to write in the column is deity. Deity. D-E-I-T-Y. Deity. The next word is going to be exaltation. Exaltation. E-X-A-L-T-A. T-I-O-N, exaltation. The next word is kingship, kingship, K-I-N-G-S-H-I-P. The next word is lordship, lordship, L-O-R-D-S-H-I-P. The next word is obedience, obedience, O-B-E-D-I-E-N-C-E, -E -E, obedience. 
The next word is priesthood. Priesthood. P R I E S T H O O D. The next word is resurrection. R E S U R R E C T I O N. Resurrection. The next word is sonship. S O N S H I P. The next word is sufferings. Sufferings. S U F F E R I N G S. Sufferings. And the last word is supremacy. S U P R E M A C Y. Supremacy. So now in the center column, and for those of you who have just joined us, you want to take a piece of paper lengthwise and fold it into three sections. Three sections. Three sections. And in the middle section, you want to write the word Christ. C H R I S T apostrophe S. And then under that column, you should have the following list of words. Ascension, betrayal, death, deity, exaltation, kingship. Again, that's ascension, betrayal, death, deity, exaltation, then kingship, lordship, obedience, priesthood, resurrection, sonship, sufferings, and supremacy. Now, as you can probably guess by now, looking at the other two columns, we're going to look at places in Psalms where it foretells the middle column. In the New Testament, it is fulfilled. So we're going to look at Christ's ascension. And we're going to turn to Psalms 68, 18. So in the first column, you're going to put 68, 18. Because that is the reference where we're going to see it in Psalms. Now later today, you may wish to go back and look at it in different versions of the Bible. But for right now, I'm going to use my New Century version, which I told you is one of my favorite versions I like to study from when I just want it to be simple and straightforward. So we turn to Psalms 68, 18. Now, you'll also notice before we get there that in my Bible, I don't know if you can see it or not, but I've actually written the three columns on a blank page in my actual Bible. And it is actually written before the first page of Psalms. It was a nice, beautiful blank page there. And I know these are references that I'm going to want to come back to at some point in time. So I've actually written them in my Bible so that when I want to come back and look at some particular topic, I will actually have it readily available. So Psalm 68. And as we turn to Psalm 68, we go to verse 18, and we find these words. When you went up to the heights, you led a parade of captives. You received gifts from the people, even, those, even from those who turned against you and the Lord God will live there. I'm gonna highlight that in my Bible because I like to make connections between things when I read them or between verses when I read them. So I'm gonna highlight this uh, as soon as I can find a color that works. And I'm gonna highlight it. Now you might notice if you're really astute that I'm using a pen 
that has four different colors on top. That's because I didn't bring my colored pencils today and I wanted to still be able to use color. So I got my pen that has the four different colors on top. So I turned to Psalm 68, 18. Is there a reference for Christ's ascension in the New Testament? Let us turn to Ephesians. Ephesians. And if you got my little system down, you know GEPC, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Ephesians, the fourth chapter and the eighth verse. Now, if you can't find Ephesians, don't worry about it. Turn to the front of the Bible. Look for the table of contents. And if it's in alphabetical order, look for E for Ephesians. If it's in Old Testament, New Testament, go to the New Testament section and look for the word Ephesians. Take your finger over, go to the page it says, and then turn to that particular page. Ephesians, the fourth chapter, and the eighth verse. And it says, Christ gave each one of us, starting at the seventh verse, Christ gave each one of us the special gift of grace, showing how generous he is. That is why it says in the scripture, when he went up to the heights, he led a parade of captives and he gave gifts to the people. Is that not the same thing that was uh, foretold over in Psalms 68? Is now found in Ephesians, the fourth chapter and the eighth verse. That ought to be something exciting because the Bible is consistent. It said that he would do it, and in the New Testament, it confirms it. Let go to Psalms 41 and 9. Psalms 41 and 9. Psalms 41 and 9. I'm just highlighting the Ephesians passage so that I will be able to readily find it when I go back. Psalms 41 and 9. And here we find it says, my Bible's pages are sticking today, so a little bit. Okay, Psalms 41. Well, sometimes your pages stick together, I guess. It shouldn't be as much as I use this Bible. 41 and 9. My best and truest friend who ate at my table has even turned against me. My best and truest friend who has eaten at my table has even turned against me. And that's talking about the betrayal. Let us look at Luke, the 22nd chapter, and the 48th verse. Luke, the 22nd chapter, and the 48th verse. And what do we find? We find, but Jesus said to him, Judas, are you using the kiss to give the son of man to his enemies? And we know that they were just having, they were in the upper room. The last supper had just finished. And Jesus says, Judas, are you giving using the kiss to give the Son of Man to his enemies. So the betrayal 
is now in the New Testament. In Psalms 22, beginning at verse 1. Psalms 22, beginning at verse 1. We see the death of Jesus. Psalms 22, beginning at verse 1. My God, my God. And in the King James Version, it says, Why hast thou forsaken me? But in my New Century Version, it says, My God, my God, why have you rejected me? You seem far from saving me, far from the words of my groaning. My God, I call to you during the day, but you do not answer. I call at night, I am not silent. You sit as the Holy One. The praises of Israel are your throne. Our ancestors trusted you. They trusted you and you saved them. They called to you for help and were rescued. They trusted you and were not disappointed. But I am like a worm instead of a man. People make fun of me and hate me. Those who look at me laugh. They stick out their tongues and shake their heads. They say, turn to the Lord for help. Maybe he will save you if he likes you. Maybe he will rescue you. You had my mother give birth to me. You made me trust you while I was just a baby. I have learned, I have leaned on you since the day I was born. You have been my God since my mother gave me birth. So don't be far from, far away from me. Now trouble is near and there is no one to help. People have surrounded me like angry bulls, like the strong bulls of Bashan. They are on every side. Like hungry, roaring lions, they open their mouths at me. My strength is gone, like water poured out onto the ground, and my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted inside me. My strength has dried up like a clay pot, and my tongue sticks to the top of my mouth. You have laid me in the dust of death. Evil people have surrounded me. Like dogs, they have trapped me. They have bitten my arms and legs. I can count all my bones. People look and stare at me. They divided my clothes among them and they threw lots for my clothing. But Lord, don't be far away. You are my strength. Hurry to help me. Save me from the sword. Save my life from the dogs. Rescue me from the lion's mouth. Save me from the horns of the bulls. I've read to you the 22nd Psalms, verses 1 through 21. Is there a similar story in the New Testament? Let us turn to Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew the 27th chapter. And let us read. And I don't have time to read it all today. But if you were to read it all today, you would find that Matthew 27, Jesus is taken to Pilate. 
Judas kills himself. Pilate questions Jesus. Pilate tries to free Jesus. And let us start over here at the 32nd verse. As the soldiers were going out of the city with Jesus, they forced a man from Cyrene named Simon to carry the cross for Jesus. They all came to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. The soldiers gave Jesus wine mixed with gall to drink. He tasted the wine but refused to drink it. When the soldiers had crucified him, they drew lots through lots to decide who would get his clothes. The soldiers sat there and continued watching him. They put a sign above Jesus' head with a charge against him. It said, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two robbers were crucified beside Jesus, one on the right and the other on the left. People walked by and insulted Jesus and shook their heads saying, you said you could destroy the temple and build it again in three days. So save yourself. Come down from that cross if you are really the son of God. The leading priests, the teachers of the law, the older Jewish leaders were also making fun of Jesus. They said he saved others, but he can't save himself. He says he's the king of Israel. If he is the king, let him come down now from the cross then we will believe in him. He trusts in God, so let God save him now. If God really wants him, he himself said, I am the son of God. And in the same way, the robbers were being crucified beside Jesus also insulted him. At noon, the whole country became dark and the darkness lasted for three hours, about three about three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabethani. This means, my God, my God, why have you rejected me? Does that sound familiar? Even in that small excerpt of Matthew 27 that we read, does it not hearken back to Psalms 21, 22? 1 through 21. Don't you get a truer picture of what Christ was, uh, may have been thinking? Because he knew it all. He had foretold this. God had foretold it in the Psalms. And he starts out with, my God, my God. When I preach that particular passage, sometimes at the seven last words, I connect these two uh, passages of scripture because I can't help but think that God on the cross in the form of Jesus the Christ remembers his own words that he has written hundreds of years below before my God my God why hast thou forsaken me and it is told again to the Israelites who are standing around and the Pharisees and the scribes who are supposed to know the word and, 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 and know the scriptures. When he starts off with, my God, my God, immediately in their minds, they ought to remember Psalms 22 and the description of the death of Jesus the Christ. Why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus did not just choose these words haphazardly as he was on the cross, dying. He chose them because he wanted to remind the people around them about how the Messiah was supposed to die. And he, in fact, was that Messiah. And he was dying just the way it had been described. My God, my God. 
Why hast thou forsaken me? I didn't really understand what that meant to really preach on it until I read Psalms 22 and I reflected and put myself in that position and I began to see all of the suffering that Jesus was enduring upon the cross. There was not only physical suffering, there was mental anguish. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Let's look at Christ's deity. Let's go to Psalms 45. Psalms 45. And when we get to Psalms 45, let's go to verse 6. And it says, God, your throne will last forever and ever. You will rule your kingdom with fairness. You love right and hate evil. God, so God has chosen you from among your friends. He has set you apart with much joy. Let us turn to Hebrews. Again, that's in the New Testament, Hebrews. And when we get to Hebrews, let's turn to the first chapter. Hebrews. The first chapter. And let us turn to the eighth verse. Again, we are looking at Christ's deity. And let us go to the first chapter and let us go down to the eighth verse. But God, now the word but is already circled in my, in my Bible because every time I see the word but and but God together, I circle it because it, it stands out to me. But God said this about his son. God, your throne will last forever and ever. You will rule your kingdom with fairness. You love right and hate evil. So God has chosen you from among your friends. He has set you apart with much joy. It's the identical text. It's the identical text to the passage that we just read in Psalms. In fact, it is the reference for this passage in Hebrews. It is the reference point for this passage in Hebrews. Psalms 8, verse 50, verses 5 through 6. Psalms 8. Verses 5 through 6. And now we are looking at the exaltation. Christ's exaltation. Psalms 8, verses 5 through 6. And it says, You made them a little lower than the angels and crown them with glory and honor. You put them in charge of everything you made. You made, you put all things under their control. Let us see where that verse is repeated. That idea, that concept, this reference. Let's turn again to Hebrews the second chapter.
And let us turn to the 6th through the ninth verses. Hebrews, the 2nd chapter, the 6th through the ninth verses. And we read, It is written in the scriptures. Starting at verse 6. It is written in the scriptures. Why are people important to you? Why do you take care of human beings? You made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You put all things under their feet. When God put everything under their control, there was nothing left that they did not rule. Still, we do not yet see them ruling over everything. Now, let's see. That talks about the exaltation. Verses 6 through 9. But we see Jesus, who for a short time was made lower than the angels, and now he is wearing a crown of glory and honor because he suffered and died, and by God's grace, he died for everyone. Right there, I just want to shout, he died for everyone. Not just some folk, not just the rich folk. Not just the people who had the big houses, not for, but for everyone. Isn't that wonderful? Hallelujah. Let's talk about the kingship. And here we have two references in Psalms. The first is Psalms 2 and 6. Psalms 2 and 6. The second is Psalms 89, verses 18 through 19. As we look at Psalms 2 and 6, we find, He says, I have appointed my own king to rule in Jerusalem on my holy mountain, Zion. And we find in the New Testament, Acts 5 and 31. Acts 5 and 31. Acts 5 and 31. We find Jesus is the one whom God raised to be on his right side as leader and savior. Through him, all Jewish people could change their hearts and lives and have their sins forgiven. He is leader and savior. He is the one. And Psalms 2 and 5 says, I have appointed my own king, my own leader, my own savior. And through him, all Jewish people could change their hearts and lives to have their sins forgiven. And act in uh, Psalms 2 and 6 says, I have appointed my own king to rule in Jerusalem on my holy mountain, Zion. It's talking about leadership, savior, rulership, and how these things fit together between uh, God pointing him his own king, king, leader, and savior. Now that gives new meaning to me as I read this because remember I'm reading in a simplified version and the word king, lord, leader, and savior. When you say giving honor to God who is 
the Lord of my life or the King of my life. It's the same thing, the Lord and Savior, my Lord and Savior. Sometimes we hear the testimony. You're saying he is the king of your life, which means he has sovereign rule over you. The king gives edicts and orders, and the subjects do them, which when you stand up and you testify, giving honor to God who is the head of my life, who is the king of my life, my Lord and my Savior, you are actually saying that he has sovereign control over you. If God says it, you do it. If God, if you read it in God's word, you are following it. If, if, if it comes a, a time when you have to make a choice, you make your choice based on what would God do in this circumstance? What would Jesus do in this circumstance? If you have to make a major decision in your life, you don't just willy-nilly go out and make it. You consult God. And then when you consult God, you actually follow his advice. It's a, it's a great thing when you can stand up and testify, giving honor to God, who is the king, the head of my life, who is my Lord and Savior. I listen to those testimonies with a great deal of uh respect when I was little because I was like mommy they have put God first in everything and I thought I'm not there yet I haven't put him first in everything I can't stand up and testify to somebody giving honor to God who is the king the head of my life because in some things, I'm still sitting on the throne. He is not the king. He does not reign and rule supreme in my life. Giving honor to God, who is the head of my life, my Lord, and my Savior. I'm, I can get the Savior thing. He died, shed his blood in order that I might have life, abundant life and eternal life that I might be forgiven from my sins that I might escape the punishment of hell and death and the, and the second death I get that it's the Lord part that sovereign control that I am I'm somewhat confused by sometimes and it is my prayer and my hope that one day I will be able to honestly testify, giving honor to God who is the king, the head of my life, my Lord and my Savior. If we go back to the kingship again, we've got Psalms 89, verse 18 and 19. Psalms 89. Verses 18 and 19. And here's what we find. Our king, our shield, belongs to the Lord, to the Holy One of Israel. Once in a vision, you spoke to those who worship you. You said, I have given strength to a warrior. I have raised up a young man from my people. And we turn to uh, Acts 39, Acts 5 and 31 again, and we can still see that God is talking about raising up a Lord and a Savior, a King, a young man, uh, Jesus the Christ. Let's talk about Lordship. Lordship. Um, and I can see that I may not finish this list, so let me give you um, the verses so that you can study them on your own. And then I will come back and we can read through them together. Because I want your, uh, your, your, your uh, paper, your three columns to be complete. Lordship. The Psalms reference is 8 and 2. Psalms 8, verse 2, and also Psalms 
110 verse 1. The New Testament references are Matthew 21 verses 15 to 16 and Matthew 22 verses verse 44 and Acts 2 verse 34 when you get to obedience the Psalms reference is Psalms 40 verses 6 through 8 and the New Testament reference is Hebrews the 10th chapter verses 5 through 7 when you get to the priesthood the Psalms reference is Psalms 110 verse 4 and the New Testament reference is Hebrews chapter 5 verse 6. When it comes to the resurrection, the Psalms reference is 2 verse 7 and 16 verse 10. And the New Testament reference for the resurrection is Acts 2 verses 25 through 28 and Acts 13 verses 33 through 35. When it comes to sonship, the reference is Psalms 2, verse 7. Yes, it is the same as the one prior. And the New Testament reference is Matthew 3, 17, and Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5. <coughs> When it comes to sufferings, you can see Psalms 69, verse 9, and Psalms 69, verse 4. And in the New Testament, for the first one, Psalm 69, verse 9, you can reference John 2 verse 17 that's the gospel of john romans 15 verse 3 and then the second reference for sufferings psalm 69 4 you can reference john 15 verse 25 lastly when it comes to supremacy, you can reference Psalms 118 verses 22 to 23 with the New Testament Gospel of Matthew chapter 21 verse 42. Let us go back. Lordship. Psalms 8. Verse 2. Psalms 8. Verse 2. And even when we, we are reading the Bible and we are uh, looking at something like Lordship. We might not quite understand what it means to be Lord or 
have a lordship because we don't use those terms on a regular basis. When I'm using my simpler Bible, Psalms 8 and 2, I can look and I can kind of get an idea of what lordship means. You have taught children and babies to sing praises to you because of your enemies. And so you silence your enemies and destroy those who try to get even. Lordship. Lordship involves teaching. Lordship involves praise. Lordship involves silence. Lordship inf involves destruction. All of those are attributes that we have when we recognize that God is Lord. Lord, he is capable of teaching us. He's capable of teaching us. Here we are to do what? Sing praises to him. If he's our Lord, we ought to sing praises to him. Uh, why? Because of your enemies. And so you silence your enemies. They got nothing to say. Uh, they come at you one way and flee. What? The Bible says a thousand ways. They're silenced. And so you silence your enemies and destroy those who desire to get even. We don't destroy them. He destroys them. That's lordship. He fights our battles. The battle is not yours. We, we're familiar with the song. It's the Lord's. We don't fight our battle. Because of lordship, he fights our battles. Okay? So let us look at Psalms 110 and 1. Psalms 110 1. And we find these words written. The Lord said to my Lord, sit by me at my right side until I put your enemies under your control. Lordship has to do with the Lord putting our enemies under our control. Not us. With our own minds, our own techniques and whatnot. Uh, trying to go out and defeat our enemies. We are allowing the Lord to go out and defeat our enemies. So how does that look in the New Testament? In the New Testament, let's turn to Matthew 21. Matthew 21. I realize sometimes some of you can get there a little faster than I can. Um, sometimes I get there a little faster than you. But it's okay as long as we get there. Matthew 21, verse 15. And what do we find? We find these words. Start with verse 14. The blind and crippled people came to Jesus in the temple, and he healed them. The leading priest and the teachers of the law saw that Jesus was doing wonderful things and that the children were praising him in the temple, saying, Praise to the Son of David. All these things made the priest and the teachers of the law very angry. They asked Jesus, Do you hear the things these children are saying? And Jesus answered, Yes. Haven't you read in the scriptures you have taught children and babies to sing praise? Then Jesus left and went out of the city to, to Bethany where he spent the night. Psalms, uh, let's turn to Acts 13. 
I'm sorry. Matthew 22, 22 verse 44. Matthew 22, verse 44. And what does it say? The Lord said to my Lord, sit by me at my right side until I put your enemies under your control. Exact wording, the reference is Psalms. Uh, lastly, Acts 2 and 34. Acts 2 and 34. Acts 2 and 34. And it says, I'm still having trouble with my eyes. The Lord said to my Lord, sit by me at my right side until I put your enemies under your control. That's the reference of Psalms 110.1. The reference of Psalms 110.1. David was not the one who was lifted up to heaven, but he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit by me at my right side until I put your enemies under your control. Now I have given you the references for Psalms and for the New Testament. And the whole purpose of this Bible study is to teach you how to study the Bible. What I am trying to do at this point is show that there are connections between the Old Testament and the New Testament. That some people say, oh, you shouldn't read the Old Testament. That's like throwing the baby out with the bath water. You need to make the connections between the Old Testament and the New Testament because the Bible is to be read as a whole. It's God's whole word not part of the word, not half of it to be thrown away. It's God's word, the whole word. The whole word is for us to understand. Remember I said at the beginning, holy ones left you basic instructions before leaving earth. Now if you went and you bought a TV set and it came with some instructions and you decided, I don't need the first half of the manual, I just need the last half of the manual. Does that make sense? It doesn't. Would you expect the last half of the manual to make sense to you if you didn't have some idea of how the first half of the manual went? That is why it is important when we study the Bible to make the connections. We saw Isaiah connections. Isaiah has connections to every book in the Bible. We now see that Psalms has connections, not only to Psalms itself, but to uh, the New Testament. We can see that there's prophetic writing in Psalms that is being fulfilled or that is being referenced in the New Testament. And we need to know what those connections are. That's why we need to study to show ourselves approved, a workman that need if not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. This is why it is important for us to actually study the Bible. Now, uh, this is another how to study the Bible. Do you have to do it this way? No. There may be other connections that you might want to look at in Psalms um, and, and the rest of the Bible. But I guarantee you, that if you start with these connections, you will have a greater appreciation for the author of the Bible as a whole. Because you will see that some intelligent, more than intelligent, design is in the workings of the Bible and at work in the Bible. And that intelligent design is the mind of God at work. Uh, John um, 
the first chapter of the Gospel of John says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning was the Logos. In the beginning was the Logos. And so the Logos is translated the mind of God. In the beginning was the mind of God. And so if we truly want to study the Bible, what we are studying is the mind of God and how the mind of God works and is at work in our daily life. And who knows the mind of God like the Spirit of God? And that's why we ask the Holy Spirit to come in and teach us what he would have us to know. Our thoughts are not like his thoughts. Our ways are not like his ways. Well, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts and his ways higher than our ways. We must always be in a learning position. That's what it means when we are a disciple. We are a disciple because we have made up in our minds that we are going to follow the mind of God and we are going to uh, transform through the power of the Holy Spirit what we would normally think about something to the way that God thinks about something. And in that sense, we are students of the word. We are students of the word. And we want to, to learn what it is that God has for us. At some point, we want to become teachers of that which we know. And we ought to be teaching somebody something about that which we know about God every day. Every day. We learn something new and we ought to pass it on. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you so much for your Holy Spirit and for the intelligent design that you have placed in the Bible. That is why we worship you, because you are worthy to be worshiped. No one is like you. There is none other like you. Who could have taken the book of Psalms or the book of Isaiah and drawn connections hundreds of years later between the two, between the Bible and Isaiah, between the Bible and Psalms as a whole. Who could have done that but someone bigger than I, bigger than man, with more intelligence than I have. God, you are worthy. Hallelujah. You show yourself to me every single time I open the word. You show me that you are God and I am not. You are sovereign. You are sovereign Lord. You are more than just the Savior. You are the Sovereign Lord. The one who knows all, controls all. Lord, help me to recognize that you are the King. Help us, Father God, to recognize you as the King in our life. And allow you to sit upon the throne and us to be the subjects and let you rule and super rule the territory that we call our lives. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Until next week, I would ask that you be safe, wear your mask, that you practice social distancing, Wash your hands and pray. And remember, God loves you and so do I.